Okay, so thanks a lot for the introduction and also thanks a lot for the uh, kind invitation. It is uh, always a pleasure to be back here um, to Strongman Institute. And um, I decided today um, to talk about a new story and uh, maybe to um, put forward a quite, um, how to say, heretical hypothesis about critical periods in cognition. Um, but before we, we start with, uh, with this new story, um, I um, would like to introduce this, uh, I hope this will work. Yep. Um, so I would like to start with this picture. It is not only a beautiful picture, it is a matter of fact, the um, picture of the year um, awarded by the National Geographic. Um, and for me, it is a kind of, um, a kind of warning um, because um, matter of fact, what we admire is not exactly what it's pictured of. And um, this is a bit what we do with the brain. We infer the brain function from very different readouts. A bit like it's shown here, we think that we see horses. A matter of fact, this is just a shadow of a zebra. Um, and this is the idea behind that I always try to not forget that um, during the entire work, doesn't matter what, how we, we um, record, analyze this um, readout, they are simply readouts of the brain first, either in forms of recordings, EEG, MEG, calcium imaging. Um, so we simply try to understand this from a readout. As I said, many readouts are around. And um, I think in this audience, it's not really necessary to make an introduction about brain rhythms. However, to have everybody on the same page and a little bit of fun, I just wanted to show you um, this movie. Now I speak louder. Imagine that each metronome, it's one neuron and the tick, it's an action potential. And um, if they just move random, what you end up, it's this picture, nothing, it's a flat line. But now as by a magic hand, these metronomes start to get synchronized. So the power of synchrony, you can immediately see it. It is a brain rhythm. And I'll stop the movie because this will be really like a rhythm. This is the power of having many neurons at the same time active. And I hope this can be stopped. Mm, not really. Okay. No. Okay, I cannot stop it, but um, I can make this. Um, so um, now, these brain rhythms have been uh, investigated um, uh, by many people, and some of them are sitting in the audience, Wolf and Pascal, and they, are, um, they show that these brain rhythms are not only the correlate of a specific behavior state, but they act as a very efficient neural code, allowing, as shown in a, in a nice work by, by John Lisman, allowing the representation of different memory items, for example, the coupling between the theta, um, around something like 10 hertz rhythm uh, with gamma something around 30 hertz rhythm. Um, this is a very efficient neural code that allows a representation of different memory items. So the brain rhythms have been largely investigated in the, in the adult brain. But we have here a symposium about development and a session about development. So the question that arises is what's going on during development? Do we have these brain rhythms um, early in life? I mean, in line with the uh, with, uh, work that uh, has been shown by Rosa, um, of course, they are present early in life. And this has been um, recorded many years ago, decades ago, also by, by French uh, pediatricians. And I will show here a movie uh, from my former colleagues uh, in Marseille and Paris that shows the brain activity of a healthy premature child sitting in the incubator. And what is obvious when you look at these traces is a different appearance of the brain rhythm, flat line alternating with these periods of discharges that can be spontaneous or can be induced 
by a sensory stimulation. In this case, it was a tactile stimulation, but similar data have been obtained also with uh, visual stimulation and auditory stimuli. So these brain rhythms are present early in life. This was a baby at gestational week 29, if I remember correctly. So a very early stage. Um, and uh, of course, now the big question is, what about this brain rhythm? How are they generated? What is their function? Of course, for ethical and technical reasons, it is impossible to investigate deeper this brain activity and the mechanism behind the relevance in humans. So we need an animal model, and I think um, our favorite animal models, the rodents, are very good um, um, in, in modeling um, a development because as shown in this uh, recent review that we published, um, they share the same uh, events of development, of course, as a at a different time scale. So it's necessary to keep an eye on the time scale when this activity is recorded. With other words, if we look now at the brain activity um, uh, in humans and rodents, one should keep in mind that the period that I showed you before in the movie corresponding to the second, third gestational trimester matches the period shortly after birth in a rat or a mouse. And if you look now at a single discontinuous event in human and rodents, you can see that these rhythms are very similar. It's almost impossible to say whether it's a human delta brush or a rodent spindle person. I must say that the nomenclature for this event is a pure historical issue. So um, depending who detected the first event, it has been called that brush. It has also something to do with the appearance of spindle burst. Of course, it has a spindle-like shape, but there is not a general nomenclature for this event. And this is a big problem when you look at the activity in the, um, uh, during development, also depending on the species. It is a big problem to really understand what people are talking about in the papers. Because very often, if you look, they're the same events with different names. Now, most of these events have been investigated in sensory areas. And I think it is not so surprising because sensory areas have a direct link with the, to the periphery. So most of these events have been investigated in the barrel cortex because of the beautiful connection with the whisker system. And I show this because it's a, it's a, it's a cover of a paper published by my colleagues um, in Marseille uh, some years ago, where they could show indeed that these brain rhythms are um, related to the, or are relevant for the um, ability to whisker of the animals and also with the internal activation of the thalamic nuclei. Similar data have been obtained also for the visual cortex, the auditory cortex. However, um, we humans, but also the rodents, are much more than our sensory perception. We have abilities that are depicted here, complex abilities like attention, recognition, inhibition, memory, short-term, long-term, decision-making, problem-solving, uh, and salience detection. And all these abilities are not, if you want to find the brain areas where these um, um, abilities are encoded, this is not in the barrel cortex, it's not the visual cortex, it's not the auditory cortex, but it is a frontal lobe, it's a prefrontal cortex. Now, the problem is a prefrontal cortex, even if it's so prominent in humans and in monkeys, it looks totally different in rodents. And this is why it was a bit of let's say, factor it out when people were talking about development because, well, it was not really clear whether rodents do have a prefrontal cortex at all. Because as an anatomist, you will say, well, this is not this. So they have also the structural, if you look at the microscopy or mic microscopic structure, it is different. However, very recent studies that have been beautifully summarized in a review by Marie Carlen show that between the prefrontal cortex of rodents and humans, there is a functional homology, even if it's not a structural one, but it's a functional one, meaning that even if the appearance is different, the abilities that are encoded by this structure that now is called indeed prefrontal cortex of the rodent are the same as those reported for humans and primates. Interestingly, in terms of developmental timeline, if you take these abilities and look at their dynamics over age, it is surprising that they do not all behave the same. 
If you take, for example, working memory, it is known also from psychological studies in humans, but also in, uh, in, in rodents, um, um, some physiological, few physiological studies, that the working memory has a kind of linear progression. So we are getting better until adulthood. However, the decision-making has a totally different shape. The decision-making evolves very rapidly, reaches a maximum around yeah, puberty, adolescence, and then drops. And so this doesn't mean that the, the rodents have a faster, let's say, so they are, um, the rodents, the, the kids, the decision is a, the, the speed, let's say, if you want. So how fast one decides in one direction or the other. This is what I mean with better. Um, and other abilities have a different slope, so they are slower in progression. Most of the studies that I said is a bit of psychology and less physiological cellular circuit basis for this assumption. Now, the question that arises is how this knowledge maps now to the real physiological development of the prefrontal cortex. So the question that we want to address is how the cognitive abilities rely on the electrical activity of prefrontal cortex during development. During defined periods of development should be a question mark. So it is really a progression. Do we have steps, as Rosa mentioned, or do we have maybe a nonlinear, something like up and downs? in the development of the, in the physiology of the prefrontal uh, cortex. Well, the second question to the second question, I'll come back later. So what we um, did was to map the entire prefrontal uh, cortex development, starting from birth until adulthood. Um, and we develop our techniques for this. Um, so everything that I will show is in vivo electrophysiology. Um, and we develop the techniques in line with the abilities of a mouse. During the early stage of development, mice are blind, deaf, they do not move. They spend 80% of the time sleeping. And therefore our recording setup, this is a mouse, it involves a head fixed, a condition where the animals really don't move because they don't have this wish to move, even if we would record them in a different situation. This corresponds until postnatal day seven. We use different electrodes configuration. All the data that I will show you are from the prelimbic subdivision of the prefrontal cortex. There is a different situation for the cingulate area and the infralimbic, because for time reason, I will take this out. And we use different electrodes. Uh, we started with this very simple configuration, 16 recording sites, and now most of the recordings are with neuro, made with neuropixels. When the animals get older, of course, we need to adapt our recording configuration to match with their wish to move and to explore. And this is why we develop these recording techniques. Um, by the way, um, these young animals hate boars. Yeah, so they don't like to sit on this ball. They, they are simply, they, I think they are, it's, it's just fear. Yeah, so uh, this is why we develop this plate where there is a slight movement in 3D. However, the animal moves the environment. Yeah, so it's not the animal moving, but the environment is moving. And then they, they move the, the, the entire recording setup with their paws. Uh, so this is how it looks like. We have different um, setups with different configuration. Most of them, they are um, um, just um, um, designed by, by ourselves, so um, on, a, on a 3D printer. So we use these um, uh, techniques now, and we um, and um, for the technical details, um, most of these um, uh, setups have been previously described. Um, so what we did was now to monitor the entire pre the prefrontal activity from this early stage of development, by the way, before, before the prefrontal cortex is absolutely silent. Um, so from pre-5 until P60, and you can see immediately how the activity changes. This is the local field potential and the spiking activity. And these are the corresponding wavelets with, uh, in, the, in the frequency. And you can see that there are two important, or there is a kind of, of break here. We have the discontinuous oscillatory activity that you observe it also in the human brain, in the premature kids, fits also from the time scale. And from, I would say, P13, P14 on, the act this, this um, periods without activity get shorter and shorter, and the activity starts to be continuous and develops a typical fluctuation 
depending on the state of the animal. If the animal is sleeping, is moving, is exploring. So all this, all these states, of course, are mirrored in the activity patterns that have been recorded here. So taking into account these differences, we focus first on the neonatal activity. So we call neonatal activities as discontinuous patterns of um, activity. And to understand how these brains activity or these prefrontal rhythms emerge, it was necessary not only to record the brain activity, but also to manipulate the brain activity. Manipulating brain activity, we developed either the manipulation through optogenetic tools. This is how it looks like in a, in a P, I think it was P8 mouse, if I remember correctly, uh, with um, the optical fiber inserted. And this is a response of the prefrontal neurons to um, activation using uh, uh, light. This was, I think, um, um, with, a, with a derivative of the chernodopsin, a very fast one. We use different in optogenetic tools, um, but we also inhibit either with optogenetics or using uh, for chronic um, um, inhibition, we use threads. And recording and manipulating, we were able to understand how the prefrontal rhythms emerge. And the result is that for the emergence, it is necessary to have a quite large circuit. Most of the prefrontal activity is a result of a hippocampal drive, um, a very prominent, very strong hippocampal drive. However, not from the dorsal hippocampus that it's uh, important for the what you heard before, but it is a ventral hippocampus. It is a nasty one that is located very deep. So it's very difficult electrophysiologically to record it instead of the, of the dorsal hippocampus that it's very, very kind and allows to direct access. Um, the ventral hippocampus has a most prominent drive on the prefrontal activity, and it's a unilateral drive. There is no direct projection back, very unusual in the brain, a matter of fact. The projection back involves a midline thalamus, uh, whereas the enterorhinal cortex acts as a, uh, and this is a lateral enterorhinal cortex, acts as a gatekeeper, boosting the activity both of the prefrontal cortex and the hippocampus. And we thought this is a kind of closed circuit. But this is not really true. This circuit is driven by the only sense that these animals do have and do use, and this is olfaction. The olfactory bulb, the activity from the olfactory bulb, either spontaneously generated or um, induced through others, um, has a very strong excitatory drive that boosts the lateral enterorhinal cortex and on its turn boosts the hippocampus and finally the prefrontal cortex. So this is how the large scale loop looks like. Now what's going on on the local side? Well, on the local side, you can see here the hippocampal drives reach the layer. I, I go quite fast for this because it's his published work. So uh, hippocampus boosts the layer five, six uh, pyramidal neurons and through um, uh, connections between the layers, this information is amplified in the layer to three pyramidal neurons that are a matter of fact, the generator of the fast oscillatory activity. So the activities that I showed you, if you look at the shape, there is, um, I call it ground rhythms that it's around 10 Hertz, but there is from time to time, these fast oscillations we call beta gamma. Correctly, it is 60 to 20 Hertz. I don't know how to call them because depending on the kind of nomenclature is very diverse in this terms, what gamma means, but just put the Hertz. So 16 to 20 Hertz, this is the activity that we get. And interestingly, this activity gets faster with age. So accelerates when the animals get older, you go from 16 Hertz at the first uh, um, uh, investigation period to the classical 30, 40 Hertz in the adult animals. So it's the same type of activity that it's uh, generated. And for this activity, and this was the optogenetic um, um, uh, paper that we, we published in 2017, showing that this for this activity, the layer to three pyramidal neurons are absolutely necessary. Now, if we have this generator, the questions that we address was, well, is this activity necessary also for the cognitive abilities of an animal or it's simply a byproduct of development? Well, this is not surprising, neurons fire. If they fire, it might be that just by chance they go in these rhythms and this rhythm have nothing to do with the ability of the prefrontal cortex later in life. So to test this um, or to address this question, 
We simply manipulated the activity of the layer to three pyramidal neurons during a very defined period of development. Four days from postnatal day seven to 11, the animals receive for half an hour these blue light pulses. Then we let them grow and investigate them during different periods, postnatal day 11 to 12, 20, 23 to 25, and this young adult stage. Well, what I should mention, it was important is that at P7 to P11, the layers are formed. So this means that the, there is no migration process taking place in the prefrontal cortex anymore. So we do not interfere with this migrational processes. So what's going on? Um, well, immediately after the stimulation, this is not so surprising. We apply light, we stimulate the neurons. We got this kind of increased arborization of stimulated neurons. Um, but this was, sorry, this was too fast. <laughs> um, but we obtained no change in the, in the activity patterns, in the spiking activity or the local field potential. Later on, the dendritic complexity, the spine density normalizes. So there is nothing else uh, uh, detectable. But what we observe are already changes um, in the behavior of these animals. So these animals were not able to recognize the mother anymore. And surprisingly, the response to an acute optogenetic stimulus was also decreased, yet not a significant level. The strongest effect was obtained at adult stage, where the animals, I go with this first. So this is a response of the um, um, pterodopsin transfected neurons in the prefrontal cortex to an acute stimulus. And what you can see is that the response is significantly decreased. On the other hand, they were not able to perform well in this um, memory, uh, working memory task. So we use this as um, um, a serial maze. And they were not able to distinguish between a mouse and an object. So the recognition memory was also impaired. And what I found quite interesting is that they have an absolutely impaired excitation inhibition balance. OK, one could say, well, yeah, you stimulate it during development and then you get these effects. And maybe this happened doesn't matter when you stimulate during development. So if you chronically manipulate development in the prefrontal cortex, it might lead to the same results. So what we did was to perform the same um, uh, stimulation, but now not at P7 to P11, so the chronic manipulation that leads to this result, but we did this four days later, P12 to P16 same type of manipulation, same half an hour stimulation with blue light, and the result was like this. So no, absolutely no effect. So it has a big importance when exactly the activity uh, um, has been manipulated. So to have a first conclusion that transient perturbation of layer to three pyramidal neurons during this defined period of development causes abnormal activity, and that leads also to abnormal abilities or cognitive abilities. Well, if neonatal period is relevant, what about later on? What about this adolescent juvenile period when so many things happen, when the cognitive abilities emerge? Well, what we did was to um, record um, this, um, um, as I said, to monitor continuously. So there were the same mice that we investigated every day. And we ended up with this picture. So we look now at um, the frequency of rhythms over age and the power. And to our big surprise, if you look at the theta rhythm, you see that there is a continuous increase. Yeah, of course, the animals get mature, they have the typical adult rhythms. But if you look now at the high activity, at this gamma, beta gamma activity, one can see that there are two mountains. There is a first peak, there is a decrease, and again, another peak. So with other words, something going on here. Yeah, so you see around P40, so it starts around P40, a few days, there is a, um, yeah, not a linear increase in the um, gamma activity. So what's a, what, how this happens? So to understand this, what we, so this is a nonlinear reorganization. Um, so what we, we, we try to understand where this is coming from. And we look at the neurons, so classical clustering, um, 
spy that's not really so classical. So clustering of spikes during development, it's a very painful um, job um, because the rules that you know from adults do, do not apply um, to these young animals. Um, but when developing the proper tools, one can observe is that the firing of the pre uh, pyramidal neurons is have the same two mountains, let's say, if you want um, um, a structure, whereas a fast spiking don't show this. So it's a first hint that probably the pyramidal neurons have something to do with this nonlinear structure. And then we calculated also the spike time um, chilling coefficient uh, between all these recording sites. And when we look at the synchrony independent of the firing rate, we observed also that the synchrony follows an interesting pattern. It increases until this pre-juvenile period that is shown here, this P28 to 35, then it breaks down and reorganizes much more precisely. Well, now, we just on a short note, we look at the activity of the interneurons. We inhibit the interneurons. Uh, no, sorry, we stimulated the interneurons, and the result was, of course, a powerful inhibition. Interestingly, and really to make a long story short, this net inhibition increases over age, but it's a linear increase. There is nothing with that follows on this on this curve. So this is shown here. That's a linear increase in the power of the inhibition. Um, in the network, leading us to the conclusion that the spiking of putative prefrontal layer to three pyramidal neurons resembles the age-dependent dynamics of gamma oscillations, whereas the inhibitory network effect uh, of this interneuron firing, the fast spiking interneurons, gradually increases with age. So it's not this non-linear structure. How it comes that the pyramidal neurons do this? We look at the structure. It's always good to look at the structure because it gives a lot of information about the function. So we observed when we look at the arborization of this, um, of this pyramidal neurons, we observed a very similar increase, decrease, also at the level of the arborization, also at the spine level. Early adolescence exuberant decrease at adult stabilizes. And the question is how this comes. Our candidate was microglia. So it can be that this structure, this is, um, let's say, cropping, trimming of the exuberant arborization takes place under the influence of the microglia. And indeed, this seems to be the case. If you look now at the early adolescence um, and also late adolescence to a certain amount, one can see that the microglia have this round structure with less ramification, indicating a very strong phagocytic activities that it's also observed when one looks uh, at this. Uh, so we look at here as a postsynaptic uh, markers and the microglia that were stained with LBA1. Um, and one can see that in this period, it's the strongest phagocytic activity of the microglia that it's um, also uh, indicated here or, some, or quantified here. You can see here it's a peak in the phagocytic activity and then goes down. So this means that the structural remodeling and I must say, it's, it's a hypothesis that was ghosting around for a long, long time, that there is during adolescence a complete reorganization of the, of the network. But if you check the literature, how many real hard facts exist on this? And it's very, very little. So this is indeed taking place, um, and this occurs under the influence of the microglia. So now, what happens if we interfere with the microglia? So we did in several ways, this interference, I will show you the data that um, are the most, um, let's say, um, how to say, most convincing, because the inhibition of the microglial function uh, bears several experimental problems. So we use this uh, inhibitor of the um, uh, CSF1 um, receptor that it's called PLX, uh, whatever number. Um, and we um, manipulated the activity of the microglia during the period that they have the highest phagocytic activity. So we inhibit them. What's the effect then? We look at the local field potential. You can see that this is under PLX. There is no, so the, the activity is much, much stronger. That is what one would expect. The firing rate increases only for the regular spiking, but not for the fast spiking interneurons. And also, um, as you can see here, so the PLX is always a magenta trace. You can see here that um, uh, the working memory errors, so in general, the cognitive abilities are uh, profoundly affected and the cognitive abilities are poor when one interferes with a microglial function. 
despite the fact that this PLX acts in the entire brain, this is one of the disadvantages of the method. We do not see this in the somatosensory cortex. We did the same experimental set um, in the somatosensory cortex, the same recordings. We tested also um, sensory abilities, the discrimination of the whiskers, the results are absolutely not affected by the PLX treatment. So apparently it has something to do specifically with the prefrontal cortex at this range. So if, if I summarize what I presented before, so we have these periods where the activity in the prefrontal cortex has an important role. One can call them, I don't know if they are critical. So critical periods, it's really for the sensory system. But I think it's a sensitive period. It's a vulnerable period. It's a period where things happen. And if then in this period, an insight, either environmental or whatever kind of insight takes place, has a dramatic, devastating effect. And to be honest, the whole stories that I presented here, it's just a control for the question that we or I had when I started my lab. And this was um, the core of a rejected proposal. And the, the question was um, whether we can somehow relay um, or, or, or link the abnormal activity during development to disease, and especially to psychiatric disorders. Um, and probably the psychiatric disorder that is the most difficult to address, and this is schizophrenia. So it is possible that this deficits that have been reported in the communication between prefrontal cortex and hippocampus in schizophrenia have as origin an abnormal maturation of the prefrontal cortex also in tight link with the hippocampus. Well, to address this question, of course, it's you have the first big problem, how to link this with this. Yeah, so mice are not schizophrenic, will never be. Um, the only thing what we can do is to generate mouse models of the etiology of the disease. That it's quite well investigated. It has a genetic component with, with many, many genes and lotches that have been identified um, as being linked to schizophrenia. I think every year that 10, 20 that um, uh, comes new. But there are also environmental factors um, that some of them are quite quite funny, like placed in time of birth. Uh, but some more easy to, to, to mimic in a mouse are infections, um, for example, like uh, influenza infection that can be easily mimicked with injection of poly-IC that is just um, you know, from the virus. This is um, um, external structure. That's a viral particle per se. So this is what we did. We used um, not one mouse. We use a bunch of mice. I think we had, if I remember correctly, we ended up with 12 mouse models investigated. And we wanted to understand if they are mouse model of a disease, they should have the same deficits. Every deficit that it's only mouse model specific, it's not a de deficit of a, of, of a disease. And we ended up with the fact that all these mouse models, they have one prominent deficit that it's also present here. They have a prefrontal hippocampal abnormal communication. So the communication between the two areas, it's, it's, it's impaired. And this is present during in adult mice, but this is true also during development. The drive from the hippocampus to the prefrontal cortex is at early stage of development weaker. Now, it can be weaker due to abnormal prefrontal activity, abnormal hippocampal activity. We should not forget we have also this guy here, the enteronal cortex. It can be that we have um, also abnormal communication, sorry, between the two. And we can also have an abnormal activity of other areas like the enteronal cortex. And it was a Sisyphus work of the last years that was made by a, a, a really great team. Um, to test each of those hypotheses in all the mouse models that I mentioned. And um, we ended up with following conclusions. Um, abnormal prefrontal activity, yes, it is. So the prefrontal cortex of this mouse model shows prominent deficits in layer to three pyramidal neurons. They are almost spineless. They have no spines due to an hyperactive microglia, and this data have been published um, a few years ago. As a result, they do not respond to stimuli with gamma activity, 16 Hertz. It's almost not present when we stimulate optogenetically these animals. They have abnormal hippocampal activity. 
As you can see here, the power of the hippocampal activity is impaired. They have also abnormal sharp wave ripples that, of course, it's, other, it's the activity pattern that it's prominently driven to the prefrontal cortex. And exactly the sharp wave ripples are decreased in, uh, in the mouse models uh, of, of schizophrenia. Finally, prefrontal abnormal prefrontal hippocampal communication. The hypothesis is also true. So we first, um, we, we use uh, clarity um, for how the movie will work. Yeah, um, so we, um, we clear the brains. We look at these uh, projections. I want to show you this movie to see how sparse these projections from the hippocampus to the prefrontal cortex are and how powerful. Um, and we observe that indeed these projections are decreased in the animal models of uh, schizophrenia. And as a result, this is a long story uh, cut short. As a result, these projections arrive, as I said, in layer five, six, they are relied later on in layer two, three. And you can see that the um, effect of this fewer projections is that the activity or the entrainment of the prefrontal cortex is decreased, particularly in um, theta range. So the hippocampus, it's a kind of theta driver for the prefrontal cortex. And the last hypothesis, what's the role of the entorhinal cortex? Yes, this connection, it's also relevant in um, during early development, but a bit different from what we thought. We thought that the entorhinal drive is you remember it was to both, to hippocampus and prefrontal cortex. Interestingly, only the connection from the lateral entorhinal cortex to the hippocampus is affected, but not the connection from the lateral entorhinal cortex to prefrontal cortex. The one is absolutely normal, whereas the other one, it's completely damaged, fewer projections, less power in the act uh, activation of the hippocampus. And um, interestingly, this, so I've, I found quite, curious that not all um, pathways are affected, but there is a selectivity, what exactly is affected and probably at which, which age. Okay, I will come to an end and summarize this data. Yes, hypothesis one is true, hypothesis two is true, hypothesis three is true, and hypothesis four uh, with abnormal activity for other brain areas. Yes, but only for this connection. The other one is absolutely not. Well, this, with this, I would like to come to an end. And this is a place where we live and work. Um, and I'd like to thank for the generous support um, several funding organizations, especially the um, DFG and the ERC. And the ERC, because they founded a project with the provocative titles of PsychoCell, and they still found it when they asked me in the interview, do you think that we have psych uh, psychic cells? And I said, yes, probably. Um, and so I still gave me the money. Um, and we, we have one cell type, and this has a pyramidal um, and neurons in layer two, three. Apparently they have a key role in this uh, in schizophrenia. This is my team um, and um, our collaborators. And yes, I thank you for your attention. I would be glad to answer questions.